Um, it's a pleasure for me to present um, our two speakers, which, to be honest, do not need much uh, introduction. I'm sure you know well who they are. Um, Ines Carrera and Roan Garossi, they both have an immense amount of um, clinical experience in neuroimaging, publications, um, training residents, etc. So, um, without um, further delay, we're going to um, crack on with this session, which uh, I've been to one of these before, and they tend to be very, very entertaining and very, um, a good, very good learning. Um, Ines and Laurent both work for Vet Oracle Teleradiology, and Ines is in charge of the neuroimaging department, and Laurent is the clinical director of the company. Um, so thank you very much, and let's welcome them to this session. <laughs> so, hello everybody, and we prepared some cases that are uh, hopefully interesting and also hopefully that you take something home that you learned, that's the aim. Um, yeah, so we wanted to present you some case, but before to do that, I just wanted just to give you an idea of how do I think as a neurologist. It doesn't mean that if you're not a neurologist, you not think like that, but I've tried to apply my thinking process as a neurology clinician to interpretation of neuroimaging case, because it's exactly the same. Um, always follow the same you know, pattern. The first question, when I was in clinic or when I look at the neuroimaging case, is to ask myself, reading the history and there is the issue, is it you know, complete enough? I know sometimes you get only a few, year, a few word, um, but it's, you know, try to engage with the people that send you the case, and that's what we're trying to do. Uh, with our client because you know the more you give them the more you receive as well so they know that we want information and so they, they, they provide us a lot of that first thing i've got in my mind does it sound neurological or not um, because sometimes only looking at the history you're like mm, it doesn't sound neurological um, if it sounds neurological the next step is to try to get an idea from the history and again it depends how accurate it is where should i look and does the image provided actually are relevant to where I suspect the lesion to be? But when I look at where is the lesion, what I'm trying to think is the problem focal, and focal, for example, would be right side of the brain. So how do I know if it's right side of the brain? Because they are very asymmetrical or unilateral sign. An animal circling to one side having proprioceptive deficit on the other side, vision loss on the other side. Or if I can't explain all the abnormality described by one single lesion, I'm going to conclude either it's multifocal or if it's diffuse. Diffuse means it's like looking at yourself in a mirror. Things are perfectly symmetrical between right and left. There is no differences. While multifocal is more like you're circling to the right, you may have vision deficit you know, on the right side, which suggests to the other side of the forebrain, you may have a head tilt. So you can't really make sense by one single lesion and it's not perfectly symmetrical. Now, you may think that what's the point to actually, you know, does neurologists do it for the pleasure and to confuse people? The reason why we do it is that what we see usually on clinical examination will match most of the time what we see on MRI. And, you know, in that case, also, when we look at the third step, so first step, is it neurological? Second step, where, second step, where should I look? Is it fo focal, multifocal, or diffuse? The third step is what kind of disease process could be there? And you don't need to spend any money to determine that from a clinical point of view. I use two things. One is the so-called vitamin D mnemonic. And for me, it's my checklist. So I don't forget anything. You know that even in, in theater, these days checklists are used for everything. And they have a, a, a usefulness. It helps you not to cut corner. It's so easy. It's Friday night, you want to go home. You, you know, it's, you're very tired one morning. You can rely on this checklist not to forget anything. So using the vitamin D, I'm going through all the disease process that can affect the nervous system. And determine if it's vascular, typically the onset would be sudden and then slowly get better or remain the same. If it's inflammatory infectious, I expect the problem to get slowly worse. 
If it's traumatic, I will expect a sudden onset, remain the same, slowly get better. If it's idiopathic, usually sudden onset, doesn't get worse. Neoplastic, same as inflammatory infectious, gets slowly worse. Metabolic disease typically wax and wane, wax and wane. Think of an animal with a portosystemic shunt, you feed him, he will be encephalopathic, away from feeding, he will get better. An animal with hypoglycemia, away from feeding, he will be encephalopathic, he will have, you know, juddering, tremor, ataxic, you know, absence, and then you feed the dog, suddenly much better. So really, usually, wax and wane. Degenerative disease gets slowly worse. So on one end, I use the vitamin D, and that, that's the information that the vet gives you, you know, when submitted the, the case to you. And on the other hand, I use, if it's focal, multifocal, or diffuse, I can narrow down even further. So what kind of disease on this vitamin D doesn't fit with a focal lesion? Well, if you think about it, metabolic, toxic. So tonight, when you ebriate it, <laughs> if you start falling on one side, I'll be worried. <laughs> you may be drunk, but there may be something else. While if you're intoxicated, things should be perfectly symmetrical. Okay? So if you're in your bed tonight and you start spinning on one side, you may be called 999. Um, <laughs> so metabolic, toxic, nutritional should be perfectly symmetrical. Degenerative, perfectly symmetrical. Focal, I'm thinking vascular, inflammatory, infectious, neoplastic. And then I can narrow down because if the onset was acute, vascular. If the onset was progressive, inflammatory, neoplastic. What will be more typical of multifocal? And I'm going to ask, you know, if any one of you, using this vitamin D, what will you consider multifocal? Can vascular be multifocal? Yeah. yeah. If you got a bleed, it may be multifocal. Multiple infarct. Inflammatory infectious. Yeah, and that's really the number one, inflammatory infectious. Traumatic. Yeah, when you get head trauma, you got you know, the, the, the coup and the control coup, you may have multiple lesions as well. Neoplastic, absolutely. So if you have neoplastic and it's multifocal, what kind of disease process, a specific neoplasia are you going to think about? Metastatic disease. And maybe on that case, you know, doing an MRI is not the first step. Maybe doing chest X-rays would be the first step to look if there's, you know, simple things to advise the clinician when you do that. So you see that, the way I tend to approach, you know, a neuroimaging case, exactly the same when I was on clinic. I look at the history, pending is, you know, decent history, um, look at the mode of onset, and try to see does the lesion described fit with focal, multifocal, or diffuse. So what we're going to do with Ines is to try to put that in practice through five different cases, um, and also to show you that having a good knowledge of this disease mechanism and what I call clinical profiling. You know, people do profiling when you go to the airport. I do clinical profiling. I look at, you know, a case and try to see, well, where does it fit the most? That's the way we approach a neuroimaging case. So we're going to go through the first um, case. So first case, Labradoodle, eight years old, female spade, three month history of mark weight loss and uh, the vet reported, and is a case that we received from uh, Sydney in Australia, developed progressive neurological sign with seizures, ataxia, and paresis in all four limbs. So again, taking that, you know, step by step, it sounds neurological to me from, you know, the, the, the description. Uh, can I, you know, localize, well, seizures, ataxia, paresis refer to the brain. However, it need to be, you know, seizures refer to the forebrain. But the fact that the animal is paretic must at least have a brainstem lesion or forebrain and cervical spinal cord. So based on that, I'm already thinking multifocal disease. The other thing is the word progressive. Being progressive, as we say, narrow down to vascular, no. Inflammatory infectious, yes. Traumatic, no. Anomalous, no. Metabolic, well, you expect to wax and wane more. Um, neoplastic. Yes, degenerative, possibly, but it's, it won't be, 
you know, multifocal. So already we can get narrowed down, you know, a little bit from that. So we prepared here, um, you see some uh, transverse images, they are labeled. Um, for those that are not um, familiarized with uh, susceptibility weighting imaging is 3D gradient echo sequence that is kind of equivalent to T2 star. Um, so this is good for delineating um, hemorrhages, uh, but also uh, vessels. So we will be able to delineate neovascularization or abnormal vessels. And the T1s that are there are gradient echo. Um, you see that there is a nice differentiation between gray and white matter. And then the ADC map. Okay, I play this video to play all the time, but well, that's it, I'll play it again. So um, I'll play it uh, twice or three times. Uh, then you can see that there are multifocal patchy intraaxial lesions. Uh, they have um, uh, some, they have a, a cortical, subcortical distribution. Others are more into deep um, um, gray and white matter junction. Um, but if you also appreciate that there are also some extraaxial uh, uh, there is some extra axial component. Uh, there is some meningeal enhancement, patchy. And now when we play the video again, you will see that there are some little tiny space occupying lesions that are extra axial. So we have two components here, intra and extra, because it's very important from the very beginning to differentiate how many lesions we have and the location of those lesions. Um, and the location is always very important to differentiate if it's intraaxial or extraaxial. And then we describe well the <coughs> anatomical um, regions. Um, so if we describe now the signal intensity, uh, you see that most of these lesions are quite well defined in T1 post contrast. Uh, they are uh, blurred uh, in T2 and, and, and in flare. In T2 and in flare, they are mainly hypo-intense. Uh, they are hypo to high iso-intense in T1. And we see that uh, they have um, a quite marked contrast enhancement. Some of them, they also have a rim enhancement. Uh, and you see also, if we look at the susceptibility weighting imaging, uh, there are some of these lesions, quite a lot of them, correspond to signal void in susceptibility weighting. And then also we see uh, that the bigger lesions are a hypo intense in ADC map. And this is what explain, uh, Lohan explained in the morning. Uh, that uh, they, um, they indicate restricted diffusion and with the surrounding them of hyperintensity, this is facilitated diffusion, probably is perilational edema. So kind of the summary of what we see here. And now just to warm up, I just want to ask you, are these lesions hemorrhagic? Yes or not? Yes, yes or not? That's it. So you see that the beauty of the MRI is that as a clinician, I'm starting thinking is multifocal and the MRI confirm what I know. Mm -hmm. Am I better off? No. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yes, I am better but, off to some degree. Uh, yeah, it, uh, we are all better off because if the radiologists don't pay attention to what the neurologists say, <laughs> sometimes we are badly. <laughs> okay. I see that most, the vast majority is saying that these lesions are hemorrhagic because they are signal voiding and susceptibility weighting. I'm not going to explain anything else here. Uh, I, I, I'm just going to keep this, this question open here. Um, 
And now, what I want to ask you is, what is the most differential diagnosis in this case? In this multifocal patchy intraaxial space occupying lesions with some extraaxial uh, component with meningeal and extraaxial nodules, we can even say, or a smaller space occupying lesions. really like this <laughs> because we can say already um, most of people they think that this metastasis and hemangiosarcoma the hemangiosarc it can be primary in the brain can be metastatic so maybe we are talking about the same thing uh, some say um, lymphoma sorry lymphoma as lymphoma. well lymphoma and... Uh, and I saw angiostrongylus somewhere, and fungal. But I think the, the vast majority uh, is agreeing that they, this is a neoplasia, and probably metastatic because it's multifocal, I guess. Yeah. So what do you do, Laurent? So what we, the question is, as I told you, we done the MRI, and what do you do next? You come with a differential, and you know, we're starting to slowly move to the bullshit bingo category there with as much as many, you know, different disease process. Um, well, clearly we need to do further test. Um, we will see that from the MRI there's more that meet the eye, but we need to do further tests. And on the case like that, being multifocal, I'm thinking, you know, metastatic disease, I'm thinking from a clinical point of view, inflammatory infectious, well, you know, one way to test that is to do CSF and infectious titer. And, you know, on the dog like that, in terms of infectious titer, I will consider, yeah, protozoal disease, but, you know, it's a bit like waiting for Godot, if you know the, the, the play by Samuel Beckett. You know, we keep looking for it, but it never turns up. You know, it's not very frequently turned up, um, Neospora and, and, proto and, uh, and Toxoplasma. However, you need to think of other things. You know, fungal disease. Fungal disease would be another one to consider. Will bacterial disease fit with that? Maybe not, you know, but in theory it could be also a differential. So we did CSF and we also, we devised CSF, we devised as well to do all the infectious titer and including that to look for uh, cryptococcus to do the uh, cryptococcal antigen uh, test, else CAT basically. And this dog had uh, an inflammatory CSF, pleocytosis, mixed cell population, so on his own, non-specific, it could be, you know, it could be an um, a MUO, it could be an infectious process. We need to rely on the infectious, you know, titer. And this dog was actually positive for um, cryptococcus on the antigen, you know, test. And this is the follow-up slide. Uh, That was done a year later, or I think, no, a year? Yes, less. Eh? Six months? Uh, yeah, a few. Probably six uh, months, yeah. Some months, but yeah, less yeah. than a year. At least six months. So you see that it's quite impressive, because it's, it's, not, it's not resolved, uh, but it's much better. Uh, it's quite obvious. And so I think it's, it's it's quite easy to jump into metastasis when we see multifocal intraaxial lesions, even if also there are extraaxial. Uh, it's extremely easy. Um, uh, but there are uh, these th this fungal diseases, and particularly um, um, cryptococcus, is something that we always need to keep in our minds, and probably is more common than we think, but it's not, you know. <laughs> uh, because it's, uh, this dog is from Australia, but we also see that in, in, in the UK. I've seen quite a few already, and, and the, in the rest of Europe. I just want to show you, do, do you want to ask something now? Yeah, just a question about the CSF. Is the CSF done before the MRI? 
Yes. So the CSA was done at, under the same procedure after the MRI, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I guess uh, it's quite common in inflammatory disease to see also in, uh, inflammatory changes in the muscles, even if you don't see any focal lesions, yes. Uh, and also because this, these dogs are, when they have all these in brain lesions also, uh, it's, it's common to see um, when they are painful, or the muscles of the neck, they, they are strained, and then you, it's, it's not that uncommon to see hyperintensities in the neck muscle. So you Yeah, because in this case, because it was very uh, ill-defined, and diffuse, nothing focal. No, for example, if you remember the, one of the images that Laurence showed this morning of Hyman Yusakuma, that were impressive lesions in the brain, but there was one nice in the muscles. This is quite typical for Hyman Yusak. Well, you're totally right. One thing is sure is that if you got the mixture of multi-systemic disease, meaning that a body system, the CNS and the muscle, that already should bring, you know, alert you of metastatic disease, but infectious disease. So like things like MUO, which is what we presume the most common inflammatory disease of the brain. Well, if you got muscle changes, unlikely to be MUO. It has to be something else, you know, there. So as a clinician, I have to say that um, I was not, I mean, crypto was not on my radar. And since I've been doing teleradiology, more and more, is on my radar and we see it more and more or we actually advise the vet to test for it so i think it's i don't think it's very common but i certainly think it's underdiagnosed um, also that's a good illustration of you know the, the how useful it is to do follow-up mri it's easy you know when you're at home to uh, trust your own you know judgment bullshit what you want to call it um, but it's really when you repeat the mri that you learn so much and to be fair, how many times in SNI, you know, we offer the client, we say we look at the MRI for free. You know, we do a follow-up report for free because it's so interesting and that's how, how we learn. So if you have the opportunity, you know, it's not for the half an hour you're going to spend, you know, you, there is so much to gain, so much to gain doing a follow-up MRI. Excuse me. Uh, I just I want... Question. Quick question, okay. sorry. Um, were there any Uh, I, at the point that we, um, no, because, the, uh, sorry, at the point that we read the first MRI, we, was, we weren't sure, but then they did a CT of abdomen and thoracic and they didn't find anything apart from some nodules in the spleen that they took by, uh, uh, FNAs and there was benign uh, nodules. So yeah, the, the fact that there is no changes outside of the brain should not be a criteria to say it's not crypto, yeah. for sure. I just want you, please, to look at the uh, lesion in the thalamus on the right side. Um, so if you, if you look well, uh, if you look at the lesion on the right side of the thalamus, it's got a hyperintense rim, hypointense center. It's got a um, signal void in, in susceptibility weighting. It's got a hypointense thin rim in T1, and a rather a slightly hyperintense rim in T1. Post, uh, pre and post without any contrast enhancement. Yeah. So with this signal intensity, a center that is hypointense in T2, very much hypointense, signal void and susceptibility weighting and hyperintense in T1, but with a nice rim of hypointensity, which is hyperintense in T2, does it fit with hemorrhage? We are now th thinking that this was the second MRI after months. If this is a hemorrhage, this should be, as Logan explained us in the morning, hemocytin in ferritin. That should be all hypo or signal void in all sequences. When I first look at the first MRI, 
I was really uncomfortable with the signal intensities and I couldn't fit them well with a hemorrhage. At the end, I thought, okay, it must be, but uh, there was something wrong there. So then when I look at this um, follow-up MRI, I was jumping on my, on my chair, thought this is something else. <laughs> uh, and then I was looking in, in the literature in people because there is no well uh, described in dogs. And this is a really nice explanation. Because the granulomas, the cryptogranulomas, uh, uh, form melanin byproducts or subproducts or some products of melanin. This doesn't mean that there is only melanin there, it's some uh, melanin products. Uh, and with this, we very well explain why is that hypointensity 2 is like the hyperintensity 1 and you still have the signal void in T. Um, in uh, susceptibility weighting or T2 star because it's very paramagnetic. So maybe from now on, these are things that we need to look at uh, when, we, when we see cases like this. Try not to mess it up. Yeah, no, good. So crypto, uh, again, um, you know, it was not on my radar. I've not become obsessed, but nearly. Uh, looking for it more and more, especially, you know, with this pattern of distribution. Um, you know, two types of crypto is worldwide distribution. Um, you can find it anywhere in the soil, you know, in the grass. Bloody pigeon as well are actually carrying a lot of crypto. Um, two types, crypto neoformans and GATI. The most common source of infection is actually the nasal, you know, cavity, but also it could be the lung and the GI tract and then there is hematogenous spread. Um, it tends to affect the CNS much more commonly in dogs than in cats. And there is a big difference in terms of species. Um, dog has a more acute form, while cat is a more chronic form. Dog has a more immune overreaction to crypto than the cat. So in terms of distribution, and that using now, you know, putting my neuropathologist hat, um, in terms of distribution in cat, it's mostly a surface relating disease. Surface relating disease, surface of the brain for me are the meninges and the ependyma. So whenever I see a pattern of meningeal ependymal enhancement, fungal disease start to really, the alarm bells start to ring in my head. Obviously, viral disease, and you know, if you've seen a cat with FIP, is a surface relating disease. Um, in dog, it is also a surface relating disease, but you are much more commonly parenchymal lesion. And very often you got this granulomatous lesion and it, they are called cryptococcoma. Um, not very common to have this jelly-like, you know, pseudocyst in dog, but in human, it is described, you know, as well. The other thing is the presence of retinal lesion and it's something that you may see on MRI. So again, whenever you got multi-system involvement, I, and brain, you're starting to think infectious, you're starting to feel multifocal neoplasia, so metastatic disease, lymphoma, um, and the like. So, as I think, at far less inflammatory, you know, than in dog, and in human, you know that if you're immunosuppressed uh, because of immunosuppressing treatment, or if you've got AIDS, you're more prone to get cryptoco cryptococcus. However, the granulomatous lesions are usually not the immunosuppressed because they are the manifestation of the response of the body to the infectious you know, agent. So how do we diagnose CSF? Very often will be high protein, inflammatory response. However, you, know, you get it with non-infectious um, inflammatory disease. Culture, you know, it's like with disco, how often we get a positive culture, more often not than we are. Sometimes you may be able to see cryptococcus in the CSF, especially if there is a high index of suspicion and you use special staining. But the way to diagnose is to do this LCAT, you know, so uh, lateral cryptococcus um, antigenic uh, test. And that dog, inflammatory CSF, positive culture. In terms of treatment, it's usually a combination. So we use, uh, in that dog, the, 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 the hospital use amphotericin infusion and also uh, fluconazole orally, so the infusion was on a monthly basis and they were monitoring the LCAT every month to look at the titer. 
And, you know, again, the importance of doing a follow-up MRI, very important. So in terms of prognosis, it's not good news, obviously, if you got crypto. Um, the remission rate is about 30% at one year. The flip side is 70% will have relapse, obviously, and, or will have, you know, die of the cryptococcus in this case. And can I just want to show you uh, uh, two cases of proven, oh no, well, this is a meningia cryptococcus. Uh, you see that we only see um, this mild meningia enhancement. Okay, thank you. And on the, on the susceptibility weighting imaging, what we see is the engorgement vessel, engorge vessels over there. So this is not hemorrhage. And so this was only that. Um, uh, and would, would only, uh, there were no other lesions in this dog, um, but this has surface-related disease, as Laurent explained. And this other one is another case of uh, confirmed crypto. You see now, as the images go from rostral to caudal, that there are intraaxial patchy lesions in the olfactory uh, lobes. But what we see, the main thing are uh, large ventricular um, uh, system, and you see a really nice ependymal enhancement and um, some meningeal enhancement. So in, in here, uh, uh, and there are also some, some hyperintensities in the muscles over there. <laughs> and I'll play it again because it's a quite nice one. We also see lesions in the, in the eyes in this case, so we have all components, um, in patchy, intraaxial, meningeal, and epen ependymal. So uh, fungal disease has to be quite, quite high on the list in, this, in cases like this when you see them. And, and well, also, obviously, depending on the, on the area where you live, you include one or the others. But uh, crypto, sadly, is now quite wide, widespread everywhere. I think the take home message is the mm -hmm. surface relating disease. Mixture of meningeal involvement, ependymal, should ring the bell, really mostly for infectious disease. That would be top of the list, you know, in, in, in this case. So, number two, you're still okay? Surviving? Um, French Bulldog, my nemesis. It took me a year, you know, when I left clinic, starting to work from home, every time I was meeting a French Bulldog in the street, my wife has to stop me, like, because I was like, oh God. Can't stand anymore. They're cute, but you know, when you're in clinic, is really a nemesis. Three-year-old female nutter French bulldog, less than 24 hours, rapid onset of paraplegia. Um, you're starting to take some, you know, think quite quick onset, so we can call it acute there. Um, the neuro exam consistent with a T3L3 malopathy. So at least we were you know, the image provided, look at the area of where you suspect to be the lesion, but remember, you may be paraplegic for other cause. It could be an aortic thrombus, so, you know, don't always assume paraplegia equal, you know, T3L3. And another important thing, the nociception was absent. So, clinically, when I used to deal with this dog, I wanted to know where the lesion is. I wanted to give an idea to the owner of what was the prognosis. And unfortunately, surrogate marker of prognosis clinically, we rely on the, on the nociception. If absent, and you do surgery, if it's surgical disease, within the first 24 hours, we estimate the chance of recovery about 70%. If it's 24 to 48 hours, maybe 50. Past 48 hours, the prognosis drops. So that's the only surrogate marker of prognosis is the nociception. And then another piece of information, the dog was mildly painful on palpation of the mid lumbar spine. So acute onset of disease, you know, you're thinking trauma, if there is a history of trauma, you're thinking disc herniation, ischemic malopathy, potentially bleed. Obviously, one of them will not be painful on examination. So, Chloe, have, can we have the video? Um, so we prepare sagittal and the transverses that are uh, going through, uh, from cranial to caudal, T1, T2, star, and T2. Uh, so what there is here is uh, ill-defined 
extradural lesion uh, on the, the right side. Um, but, uh, yeah. You can see the, the extradural lesion is uh, at the level of the um, um, T1 hemivertebra um, and is heterogeneous, uh, is mainly hypointense in T2 compared with the spinal cord. Uh, is ISO2 hyper in T1 and it's got a uh, marked signal void in T2 star. Uh, it's quite compatible with an uh, intervertebral disc extrusion with some uh, hemorrhagic component. Um, at the level of the um, extradural lesion, uh, you see that the spinal cord well, is causing moderate spinal cord compression and the spinal cord at that level uh, is markedly hyperintense in T2. Uh, and you see that it's affecting both uh, gray and white matter. In some areas, it's more gray matter. And then when we go move forward uh, uh, um, caudally and quite far away from the, the extradural lesion, we can see that the spinal cord is still really swollen and hyperintense in T2 but uh, we can tell perfectly nice in T2 star that we see patchy high uh, signal void areas in white matter and then one that is uh, quite center uh, like in the center canal uh, signal void so that means that um, we have an extradural lesion um, that I say already it was an analysis, <laughs> but it's, it's just straightforward, right? Um, but uh, the, the, probably the concern here is this type of intramedullary lesion that is quite extensive, is hyper intense in, in T2, um, but it's got signal void areas uh, in T2 star, likely hemorrhage, that are quite uh, caudal from the lesion. Um, and the muscle change, the muscle change, right. the muscle change. So when we look at an MRI like that, you know, we look, what we want to know clinically, is it, yeah. if there's a surgical disease, so is it compressive? If there's any core changes, and you've noticed as well the paralumbar spinal uh, muscle changes as well, which, you know, you often see um, in acute myelopathy as well. So we've asked you what is the main concern in this patient. Okay, so the overall majority, we think invertebral disc extrusion concern um, about myelomalacia. So, you know, again, going back to the clinic, um, when you got a spinal injury, whether or not it's a disc extrusion, whether or not it's an ischemic myelopathy, you got two phenomena happening. You got the primary injury, which is what's happened at the time the injury starts, the disc extrude, or there is a blockage of the artery and ischemic myelopathy. And then you're going to have a cascade of vascular and biochemical event that will aggravate the primary injury. And that's what we call the secondary injury phenomenon. Usually last 24 to 48 hours. As a clinician, when I look at an MRI, I want to know, does the degree of, if there is a compressive and extradural lesion, does the degree of compression justify the clinical sign in terms of severity? If not, then this case, doing surgery is probably not you know, the way forward. Um, the problem is to know, can I find any surrogate marker on imaging to give me information about the prognosis? And there have been many different ones that have been proposed, and I, I will talk about it in a sec. But one of the big fear as a clinician is to do surgery, and despite the surgery going very well, the dog is not recovering. And the worst ever fear is to do surgery and the dog start to develop the so-called ascending and descending hemorrhagic melomalacia. Um, because we, we always think of 
the, in terms of grading, grade five is the worst, paraplegic, incontinence, no nociception. Well, unfortunately, sometimes it could get even worse. So when do we suspect clinically hemorrhagic progressive melomalacia? Most of the time it's seen in dog, I've never seen it in cat. Um, and when you got a T3L3 acute myelopathy, usually either an exogenous trauma or a disc extrusion, the sign will progress. And how can they progress? Well, when you have a lesion between T3 and L3, only the hind limb will be affected and they'll be paraplegic. You will have usually normal to increase reflex. When you get hemorrhagic ascending, descending melomalacia, the lesion will start to go caudally and you're going to start the losing the tone and the segmental reflex. You're going to also lose the sphincter control, so you're going to have a dilated anal sphincter. But you also go cranially. And when the dog initially was only paraplegic, he starts to be weak on the front leg. Then he will start to lose the function of his front limb. And what you got there is also all the nerves that are responsible for the ventilatory drive. So the animals start to become hypoxic. Not a good way to go. Clinically, we also suspect that because you got a cranial migration of the cutaneous trunca reflex. Okay. You can develop anywhere from a day to five days after the onset. So it's something that always is, you know, hang there. Thankfully, it's not very common. At least, you know, they usually say less than 10%. I think it's less than that. But you got hemorrhagic, you know, necrosis of the spinal cord. Okay? Hemorrhagic necrosis of the spinal cord. Malaysia is a histopathological diagnosis. You got softening, you know, of the spinal cord. So as I say, do we have reliable surrogate marker of prognosis and melomalacia? Well, many have been proposed the length of T2 hyperintensity of the spinal cord and in relation to L2, or using the uh, attenuation of the CSF and cyberagnoid space using haste or using um, uh, short uh, fat spin echo as well. The presence of, you know, uh, signal void, but signal void are not always present even with hemorrhage. And if you use a low field MRI, you're even less likely to see it. Last year, there was really nice abstract on also the squeeze sign. And the squeeze sign is what we see actually on histopath, where you got rupture of the central canal, hemorrhage just above the central canal, surrounded, so you got a signal void on T2 and, 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 and T2 star, or susceptibility uh, weighted imaging, surrounded by an hyperintense T2 uh, ring. Um, but, you know, all these criteria, the problem is that we can pick up the worst case. So when there is extensive T2 hyperintensity, when there is, you know, this um, uh, squeeze sign for many, you know, vertebral length, and the dog has clinical sign compatible with that, so it's paraplegic, no deep pain, then I will be, you know, confident to say there is a risk of the dog developing that. But you still need to correlate with clinical sign. The issue is that by the time you do the MRI, it could be totally normal and have none of this surrogate marker and then develop melomalacia. So that's the issue we haven't found yet. And this latest study has shown that, that you know, there's a lot of markers, including also the lack of contrast in the venous sinus, but we still need to correlate to the clinical sign. However, when you face with a French bulldog of Daxun that need emergency surgery, now, is he going to develop melomalation in the next few days? We still don't know. We still can't really pick up on that. They will be in discomfort. They will be in discomfort when they have melomalacia. They may be also systemically unwell, they, and they, have, they can be also parexic, you know. Um, so the, most, the first sign is the migration of the cutaneous strong guy. So if I, if I had a, a grade five and I did surgery, I take a little marker, make a line where the paniculus stop. And then they have twice a day, evaluate and see, and the nurse will do that, see if there is a cranial migration, because that would be the first alarm bell to say things are not going. So it could be that you didn't do a good surgery. And again, repeating the MRI sooner than later, always, always indicated. When something don't go to plan, don't hide between, you know, possible explanation, repeat the MRI. 
repeat the MRI in this case. I should have said that there is two types of um, myelomalacia. Myelomalacia, pretty much, when you got a spinal cord injury, you will always have a part that die. So you get some form of you know, neuronal loss and you know, myelin loss. But it's usually contained, it doesn't get worse. The hemorrhagic ascending, descending um, is another one. Um, obviously, the clinical setting. You don't expect hemorrhagic ascending, descending melomalacia unless you got grade five paraplegic with that. Um, the lesion, histopathologically, is centrifugal. So it starts at the level above the central canal and then he expands. And actually, if you do a sagittal view of the spinal cord, he has this you know, ellipsoid shape. So at the level of the injury is fairly big and then it tapered like that. I will not expect that with hematomelia, personally. Right, case three, still okay? Now we're going to talk about cat. Um, Four-year-old Burmese cat, in and out, like a cat. Um, he was fine in the evening, in the garden, paralyzed. So the problem with cat is all the nice thing I was telling you about asking the owner about the mode of onset and so on. Well, 90% of the time, cats have a life on their own and 10% with their owner. So getting an idea, was it sudden or not difficult? When did you last see the cat? They saw it, you know, in the morning, so something happened acutely to be fine like that in the garden. That was another case from, of ours from Australia. Um, there is a lot of nasty thing there, living. Um, and cr creepy crawly, and this is, uh, obviously, there is snake in the area, but, but no snake was seen, but I presume the snake is not going to leave his, you know, uh, business card and say I was there. <laughs> and clinically, the cat was paraplegic, reduced spinal reflex, flaccid tail, no nociception, both hind limb and perineum. Now it's going like that in your head, but to keep you in your toe, remember, paraplegic, Reflex are reduced, the tail is flaccid, no nociception in the hind limb and perineum. Where will you localize the lesion? Now you're not laughing. That's beautiful. Ah, there's an orthopedic surgeon in the room. <laughs> Who is it? <laughs> Have you noticed that the orthopedic surgeon, if you paralyze, is LS? <laughs> Actually, if you lame, it's probably a cruciate. But if you already done a TPLO, then it's LS. <laughs> and because they give epidural steroid and you get better, that's LS. That's <laughs> The proof is in the pudding. So 91%, you're totally right. What gives me an idea that it's spinal and not aortic bifurcation or iliac bifurcation, the flaccid tail. If you have a flaccid tail, it cannot be aortic or iliac bifurcation. You need to have a lesion at least in the caudal part of the spinal cord. So putting the paraplegia, loss of spinal reflex, flaccid tail, L4 to S3, you're fantastic. And now we have this video that I found this MRI really beautiful. Hope you too. Um, so I'll allow you to play a few times for you to, to spot the lesions. So we'll play it again. So from the MRI, we see that we were right with the localization L4S. <laughs> um, so if we start, um, well, the vertebra, central vertebral text, they are normal. Uh, we have a quite extensive uh, intramedullary lesion. 
uh, that is bilateral and symmetrical almost, affecting quite beautifully grey matter and is a hyper intense in T2. It, it causes a swelling of the spinal cord uh, as we cannot see any CSF around the spinal cord. In my opinion, we don't need haste too <laughs> because we can, uh, when we look at the supernoid space, uh, so we can see that very nicely on the T2. And you see that this lesion is also hyper intense in T2 stars, so we don't have any evidence of hemorrhage, intramedullary hemorrhage. And uh, there is mild contrast enhancement, and this is confined to gray matter. Um, uh, and we don't see any extradural lesions or any uh, intradural. So in, in summary, in the spinal cord, what we have is an extensive um, intramedullary lesion affecting gray matter diffusely. Um, if we look at the um, muscles, uh, it's quite nice that exactly pretty much from the level uh, or all along the level of the spinal cord lesion, the muscles are, the, the epaxial muscles are hyper intense in, uh, in T2 and in T2 star and they show contrast enhancement. Uh, and this, these changes are uh, bilateral, almost symmetrical. And if now we look ventral, we can see that there is the retroperitoneal space also along that area uh, is, is very heterogeneous and hazy and uh, since that there is some fluid within it, quite ill-defined. Uh, when I read this case, I saw something here in the skin, a uh, discontinuity. Um, but clinically, they couldn't see any. Uh, but to me, this, uh, it was there in the MRI, something that is, uh, is different from the muscular lesions. Um, so it's, it, it is quite interesting, right? Because it's a, it's a case that uh, <coughs> the findings in the spinal cord uh, affecting the gray matter um, is, is indicating us that this is an ischemic myelopathy. And we don't think that we are thinking about an FCE or an infarct, a regular one, because it's quite extensive. Plus that we also have some other changes that we don't see with FCE. Uh, and that are, are those muscular changes, that it could be um, myositis, but this, this, this case is acute. Um, uh, it could be also some degree of uh, ischemia in the muscles. And, and uh, this, this retroperitoneal effusion is definitely something that uh, perhaps is indicating something to do with vasculitis or, well, limited information here because we don't have a, a CT. So, what do you think, uh, what is the, the, the most likely cause that could could explain all these findings. Beautiful, there start to be some uh, pattern emerging there. A snake bite, lymphoma, trauma. <coughs> trauma is a bit lazy, to be honest, guys. Because it means everything and nothing. But yeah, quite, uh, quite a few. We nearly like got the whole uh, uh, glossary of any book. <laughs> but yeah, definitely uh, toxic snake, uh, trauma, again, seems to be high on the list, vasculitis, 
you know, as well for the purpose of time. And we don't have a definitive diagnosis on this case. And I have to say, in SNI, we had two different, you know, opinions of what it could be. I think they both are hopefully valid. And, you know, if you got other opinion, we welcome that. Um, my first thought when I saw this case, and one of you, I think, mentioned it, or more than one of you, um, is what we see when cats get trapped in the window, the vasistas. Um, I've seen it also with cats that get, and I, had, I remember very vividly a cat um, that was fine in the garden hanging around the rope around his lower abdomen. And the cat, when he was free from the rope around the abdomen, was paraplegic. When we did MRI, we found exactly the similar lesion. There was some muscular lesion in the lower lumbar spine, some retro uh, peritoneal changes, but the, the lesion in the spinal cord were specifically affecting the gray matter. Okay. Um, I know very little about horses, but what I remember when I did the board a long time ago is that there is a condition in horses called poliomyelopathy that happens following general anesthesia. And it happens with young horses when they are GA in, uh, in dorsal recubancy. Imagine all the weight of the abdominal vis viscera there putting pressure on the caudal vena cava. What does it happen there is that there is obviously congestion in the spinal compartment. So the, especially the venous sinus will get very congested and that will affect the blood perfusion to the spinal cord because of the congestion. As a result of that, you're going to have ischemia affecting, you know, this gray matter. And histopathology, it looks exactly the same as this cat, you know, there. Um, so another cat that I had that get trapped there with the leg hanging, you got muscle changes. And the same thing as this, you know, this, the, the horses, the abdominal viscera put pressure on the caudal, you know, vena cava. Other hypothesis that uh, Ines came up with is obviously the, the possibility of a snake bite. Uh, I, I thought, okay, we cannot rule it out because it's from Australia. May, maybe, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't remember your name. Maybe you can correct me and explain us a bit more <laughs> because I, I, I know nothing about the snake bites and, and, the, and there are no cases reported. Uh, so I, I just couldn't find anything in the literature and also there were no many cases from the window trap. So I thought, okay, I need to consider both. Um, so then I was, I, I was reading some papers in, uh, in, in research papers in, in people and they explain uh, how amazing are the, the venoms of the snakes because there are many. So it's not only one, they can be even 60 in one, in one single snake. And apparently they have, different, uh, they, they can have different groups of toxins. So the most dangerous ones are the neurotoxic uh, that they, they, they have. Uh, they, and with, amongst them, they are divided into presynaptic and postsynaptic, and they are lethal, but they are horrible. And then there are others that they have hemotoxic and myonecrotic uh, uh, toxins. I thought, oh, this fix. <laughs> because this one, um, when they, they have this type of toxins, Apparently, they, they cause a vasculitis, and this is what is going to cause an infection. Uh, and I wanted to see uh, something on, on the side of the, the cat from this MRI. Um, uh, so maybe it's something that if we see more, because now we are reporting all around the world, <laughs> maybe we can gather them together and see if we find the same imaging features. And apparently other, other snakes, what they, they have is hemolytic factors, and what they cause is a, just a generalized hemorrhage. Have you seen any? Um, we reported extradural um, uh, um, hemorrhage, if you like, in a dog detected on CT. Hello. Many years ago, I was involved in a report of extradural hemorrhage in the cervical spine of a dog that we were detected on CT and that went to surgery. That was a snake bite. Um, I think I am not good at snakes because I'm very removed from them as well. I think Australian practitioners are very good at diagnosing snake bite, often without um, advanced imaging and would uh, potentially um, check that with uh, what, what do you do, the little... The little 
There's a little card and a little test that you can do here. I was going to say, all the ones I saw in general practice were much more diffuse neuropathy, mm -hmm. and the cats also tended to come in with a very characteristic um, smell in their nose because it also paralyzes their uh, breathing muscles, so thoracic okay. muscles yeah, as well. Yeah, so I would expect it to present as a much more diffuse. Yeah. So yeah, long and winds. Neurotoxic. It's, it was a window. <laughs> did, did you get any feedback from the practice it was that put submitted down. it? This cat was put oh, down, yeah, yeah. because and of the the severity of the neurological sign and yeah. yeah sure and never say never right with a snake because there's not a lot known about that kind of yeah. level of disease yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. thank you <laughs> very good so this two-year-old female nutter ragdoll uh, one week ago become quiet anorexic and then rapidly over two to three days developed neurological sign and it was fine collapse like any cat that is unwell um, <laughs> What is interesting here is that the cat is unable to generate voluntary movement or reduce. Dilated pupil, also being blind, no menace. And he's got this, you know, he got ventral flexion, but not through reduced tone. Reduced tone is just like what This one is really spastic ventral flexion of the neck. So the cat is tetraparetic, dilated pupil, loss of vision, ventral flexion of the neck, but a spastic ventral flexion, you know, of the neck. And you can see here the lack of menace, you know, response. And it's the kind of case when you've seen one, you always, always, always remember. Clinically, what I'm, I take from that, it has to be more than one region of the brain involved to have the loss of vision, to have the tetraparesis, Four brain will not be enough, you need to be brainstem. But also the signs are fairly symmetrical. So remember when we start them in this symmetrical presentation, toxic, metabolic, degenerative, nutritional. So and we see the MRI. I cannot play the video, but I, I have the, the images here. Uh, what I wanted, my aim was to play the video and, uh, and you will see the bilateral symmetrical lesions and then review the anatomy. Uh, so now we review the anatomy straight away. Uh, I think it's quite important that we have a good knowledge about neuroanatomy and, and sometimes it's good to remind ourselves. Uh, so uh, we see that mark the lateral geniculi, uh, the caudal, caudal colliculi, the facial nuclei, and the, the cerebellar nodules uh, that I mark it from the sagittal view that we see that hyper intense there, um, that it, it corresponds to the transverse view at that level. Um, so we have bilateral symmetrical lesions um, that they are all hyper intense in T2, they were also hyper intense in T and flare, I saw intense in T1 and without any contrast enhancement in this case, and they have no mass effect and no perilational edema. So it's extremely likely uh, that, that this is a, a metabolic nutritional disease. Um, but I guess you agree, uh, so um, how can we do this uh, at once? What is this? <laughs> yes, <laughs> very good. So, so this is a typical case of I am in deficiency. What did I suspect it clinically? Uh, when I was discussing the case with Ines, you know, you got a cat that is tetraparetic, loss of vision, or nearly tetraparetic, ventral flexion of the neck. That's a lot of signs, you know, sound like famine. Why nutritional or toxic, you know, in a case like that? Um, because to to over disease process that will affect, for example, the brainstem causing tetraparesis and the forebrain will have to be very extensive. This cat is aware of his surrounding. So I, I usually talk about smart disease. Smart disease is disease that specifically can affect certain regions of the brain and spare overs. Nutritional toxic are smart disease because they will affect the neuronal cell body while sparing the rest. And that's why this cat is still aware while being nearly tetraplegic. So that already moves you from the classic brain tumor, inflammatory, infectious disease. We're looking more, you know, the unusual, you know, type of case. And this cat on MRI had, you know, syringes, 
that are fairly typical of thiamine deficiency. So what is the cause of thiamine deficiency? Well, you can have it for many reasons. If you are anorexic, you may become, if you're cat, thiamine deficient. Um, also, if you only eat fish. So I remember very well a case where um, the cat um, didn't want to eat. And he transpired that he had a GI problem. And the owner were giving him, you know, a all-you-can-eat buffet. When, you know, a cat doesn't eat, it's like, you know, going to a buffet in a post restaurant, you got everything. The only thing he was eating a little bit was the fish. But eating only that within two weeks become thiamine deficient. You can have also thiamine deficiency because the, there is an abnormal batch of processing of the food, which is another case uh, that we had a few years ago. Or you got poor absorption or sometimes no underlying cause. So how do you diagnose thiamine deficiency otherwise? What do you suggest to do? So you can measure thiamine blood. Do you know how long it takes to get the result? Two weeks. You can do organic acid, organic acid profile to look at the byproduct that will accumulate as a result of thiamine. Three weeks. Can you realistically wait that long? Of course you can't. The best way to diagnose it is a therapeutic diagnosis. You inject thiamine, IM, 50 milligram on the cat twice a day. And this is the cat four hours later. The cat is in the same house. He was the house of uh, a friend orthopedic surgeon of mine. That's the cat four hours later, four hours later. You know, I was worried by doing teleradiology, I will miss not, you know, the owner sometimes being a bit demanding or the French bulldog, I will miss the interaction. When you receive a follow-up video four hours later of that, it's amazing feeling, amazing feeling. To make a difference like that remotely is an amazing feeling. That's the cat four hours later, not back to normal, but we've got, <laughs> we've got a marked improvement, and that's a therapeutic diagnosis. We are in the right direction. We can pursue, you know, in that direction. But the cat recovered fully, you know, and then we did further tests to look for intestinal disease. What, what was the cause? So on this cat, uh, he was anorexic. I think he had GI disease initially, and he became thiamine deficient. Case five. Um, is uh, um, another cat um, that the owner report many episodes of running fanatically around the house, uh, often in cycles, bumping to things, uh, salivate and often urinate. And straight after he was distressed and will hide and won't be herself for until the next day. And then it was normal, uh, kind of, and then he will do that again. So it was like a what's and running. Um, in the neurological examination, and we, as we have it, um, uh, it was an um, um, absent manner response, but otherwise was neurological normally at, at, that, at that time that was, uh, was um, examined. In this case, I'm going to do that differently. Um, so I, I, I want to ask Maria Miguel, please, <laughs> to read the case for us. Give her a bit of... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I have the honor uh, to do a project with her um, about metabolic diseases. And she's becoming an expert. <laughs> uh, so I think it's the right person to read the next case. So Maria is a resident in Southern Candies. And thank you for Bea Moreno, her supervisor, <laughs> to allow us to do this project. <laughs> thank you, Ines. Um, so I'm going to try to describe this case in the same way that Ines and me, we do usually. Uh, of course, this time is a bit different because I have so many radiologists looking at me right now. So no pressure. Um, so what we like to do when we describe a case is to start assessing the brain volume. And in this case, uh, we can see that this patient has an increased brain volume because we have mild um, effacement of the CSF that is located usually within the sulci. And this is secondary to um, thickening or um, swelling appearance of the cortical gray matter. I don't know if you can see that it's also um, hyper intense um, more than usually. And this is um, causing an 
increase in the normal gray white matter de uh, definition. We have also bilateral symmetric intraaxial lesions um, affecting multiple gray matter nuclei. So we can see uh, affected the globus pallidus, lateral geniculate, we have lesions in the thalamus. Um, I don't know if we can put it again. We have affected also the rostral colliculi and also the uh, lateral laminiscus and finally the cerebral nuclei, um, which include from medial to lateral. Um, we have affected the uh, fastigial, interpositus, and the lateral dentate nuclei as well. Um, there are also some mild white matter changes, more marked in the cerebellum. We have this kind of inverse appearance of the arbol vitae that I love to describe it like that. Um, and there is also mild changes um, in the cerebrum, especially uh, noted in the corona radiata. So we have bilateral symmetrical intraaxial lesions um, that are hyperintense in T2, so already mentioned this, and high so intense on T1. Um, so this is most likely a metabolic or nutritional brain disease. Mm -hmm. uh, and do you think that this is compatible with thiamine deficiency? I don't think so, because they are slightly different from what we tend to usually. So the anatomic regions are slightly different. We have this thickened cortical gray matter, as I said, that is quite characteristic. We have also affected the basal nuclei, and in this case, the globus pallidum. Um, and we have affection of the lateral lemniscus and the cerebellar nuclei, which are usually locations when, where we don't tend to see with thiamine deficiency. And what is your main differential? I would say an L2 hydroxyglutaric aciduria. But this is more common in dogs than in cats, right? I hope it can happen in cats as I've well. Never Luan. Cats. <laughs> I've never seen it in cats. That's why. So that's why it's a cool case because um, it's a cat. And you know, it's just to alert you that um, disease process that we've seen in dogs, Staphylococcus bulteriae, um, was the first one when we reported in Westie, um, can also happen in cat. Um, just to show you an example of a dog, Ruth, you will recognize straight away the, the AHT and Alberta on the picture. So, you know, it was first described in 2002 uh, by Simon and I resident, Carly Abramson, and initially in uh, seven Staffordshire Bull Terrier. It was a beautiful grass at the AHT where the dog were eating, that's why it's thriving. Um, but the Staffy usually, you know, they're, they're normal dog. They, you know, the owner will say is a bit special, uh, a bit slow. Um, definitely not normal in my book. Um, but usually they present with stiffness, ataxia, that tend to get worse with excitement or with exercise. They may also have seizures and they may have behavioral disorder as well. So abnormal behavior. Um, in terms of pathophysiology, it's part of the organic aciduria, where, you know, in that case, there is an enzyme missing, L2 AGA, so L2 um, uh, glutaric aciduria dehydrogenase. And this enzyme is very important because within the mitochondria, it converts L2 HGA into alpha ketoglucaric acid. Okay? So in the, it's very important in the energy production. If the enzyme is missing, the L2-HGA will accumulate, and that will be toxic for the neuron. Hence, why the lesion is mostly gray matter. Again, remember, toxic, like that, gray matter, you know, disease, because they are the more sensitive to energy, you know, deprivation. Diagnosis is done, um, well, when we first described that, we didn't have a genetic test for L2-HGA. And we diagnosed that by looking in the urine at the organic acid profile and seeing what will accumulate as a result of this enzyme being missing. So that's the way we diagnose L2-HGA. There is obviously you know, no treatment for this condition. So I think these two cases, and thank you, Maria, so much for this nice uh, description. I think they are... <laughs> Yay! Mm.
So I, I think these two metabolic cases is an, a good uh, summary for reviewing one? neuroanatomy and to remind ourselves that we need to um, keep That's studying neuroanatomy because it helps us in three. cases like this to differentiate yeah. between diseases and also to um, um, uh, the, the study that we are doing, uh, Maria and I, are, is about um, stratifying me metabolic diseases into w white matter and gray matter and between and monster to define what, which are the anatomical regions that are more affected in each one in order to be more specific with our differential diagnosis. Because normally, when we get a metabolic disease, we get a bit crazy reviewing all the papers because they are case reports, we don't remember them, and, and then we put everything in the same sack, and then uh, they need to do many tests. So I think as radiologists, we should help as much as we can to be as, ma more specific, as much specific as we can. So this is a nice example, for example, of this dog with aciduria. That is extremely nice to see all this, again, like a neuroanatomy lesson of the brain, of uh, the anatomy brains that are, uh, anatomy regions that are affected, the globus pallidus and the putamen, uh, the thalamus and the subthalamus that are affected with these little lines there, beautiful. Uh, the caudal colliculum and the oculomotor nuclei that does this bend like this, so beautiful. Um, the lateral lemiscus, uh, the vestibular nuclei that I, I mark them also on the sagittal view because they are really long. Uh, it's not just one, they are many and they are really long. And, and the, uh, again, more caudally vestibular nuclei and the three cerebellar nuclei that there are. So, uh, well, now I'm going to do more publicity about the, the study. Whenever, if anybody has ca confirmed cases, you can contact Maria or myself, <laughs> and then we do a, a, a super nice multicentric study. So, thank you very much.